All right, welcome to the Scrum Master Power Hour. As you all know, my name is Patty. Um, you probably met me through LinkedIn. I put a lot of content out there that supports newer Scrum Masters. Um, whether you are brand new and you're transitioning into the role or you're in the first few years and you're trying to figure out what the heck is going on here. So um, I decided to do an Ask Me Anything session here kind of as a um, detour from some of our normal fireside chats and our content um, during our biweekly meeting. And I've invited my friend Mark Metz here, like the baseball team. Um, and I'm going to have him introduce himself just so you know who he is. Um, he's going to be help, uh, helping facilitate our conversation today a little bit. Um, if your mic happens to be on, please go ahead and turn it off. Um, that way we can all hear the conversation that takes place here. All right, so Mark, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, so hey everybody, Mark Metz, um, live in Columbia, South Carolina. You can probably tell from the strong Southern accent which part of the country I'm from, but been a scrum master for a few years now. And uh, Patty asked me to help her out with this since she's gonna be taking questions and was more than happy to, to do that. I really think a lot of Patty and she does a great job for the community uh, by and large for Agilists and Scrum Masters. So yeah, I jumped at the jumped at the chance. Would love to meet up with you on LinkedIn. I'll put my, uh, let's see, I'll put my uh, a URL, how you connect with me there. And also I'm um, I'm uh, one of the co-facilitators of a group called Scrum Masters of the Universe and would love to have you all there. We meet, I don't know, several times a week and have interesting speakers. Patty has been gracious enough to join us at Scrum Masters of the Universe and give a great talk on Newton's laws. And uh, yeah, would love to have you there. So I'll put those links and uh, good seeing you all. All right, thanks, Mark. So Mark is gonna kind of be, he's gonna be monitoring the chat and calling out some questions for me, as well as monitoring like who has their hand up, um, because I only see five or six people and I don't want to make sure that we don't miss you. Um, so. And real I mean, quick before we get started, yeah. Patty, I see Kamran has his hand raised. I just want to make sure he didn't have a question. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no worries, just wanted to make sure. Yep. <laughs> All right. And it looks like everybody has their name on their screen. So that's good. We were gonna say if somebody was, you know, their name was iPhone, um, help you change the name so Mark knows who he's calling on. All right, um, well, let's get started with this. Like I said, I wanted to kind of put myself on the hot seat here and take questions from the community. What burning things do you have on your mind that maybe you've never asked anybody before? I know Mark is like getting ready. Um, what have you maybe not asked anybody before? You didn't know who to ask. Um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm offering up today. So this is not rehearsed. I'm gonna talk off the top of my head, but as some of you know that have been here before, I am an open book. I just speak my mind. I, I, I tell it like it is, I tell the truth. Um, and what I want to go beyond today is giving you those standard answers that probably everybody gives you. And since I don't know necessarily everybody and what those might be, um, I, I'm gonna try not to do that, but I, I do wanna acknowledge that there is a lot of advice out there and sometimes um, it may come across as vague <laughs> and it may come across as unhelpful. So I do want to give you some new tips that maybe you've never heard before and encourage you to push yourself out of your comfort zone and give these things a try. Um, because what I feel, and I said this to Mark before we jumped on the, on the call here, um, you know, if you're hearing a lot of the same things from people, um, it's either possibly time to take some of those suggestions or maybe try something different, right? If those things are not working for you. All right, so let's get this thing started. Um, we'll go until about 6.30. And I did hit record, so I will email this out on Monday to everybody, including those that were not able to attend today um, to make sure that all this goodness is sent out into the community. All right, so 
Who's up first? So my question is, how did you go from science teacher to Scrum Master? How did you even hear about it? How did you know what it was? All of that. That's a great question. And hey, Nicole, good to hey. see you. <laughs> I'm doing my nails. That's why I have my camera off. <laughs> I'm still well, listening intently. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot of folks in in this um, new Scrum Master community that are transitioning from something else into Scrum Master. My journey started out as a science teacher and you may see some science content out there. Like Mark mentioned, I talked about Newton's laws uh, recently in a talk, um, but that's where I started my career. I started my career out as a middle school science teacher in Georgia, outside of Atlanta. I found that a, middle schoolers were not like super interested in having me stand up and run my mouth about science all day. They were not really interested in that. Um, but it was my responsibility to make sure that they got a solid education. So I thought, how could I possibly get the best of both worlds here? And I reached back into some of the things that I used, learned in my master's program, as well as some additional research I did and I found that I wanted to step out of the front of the classroom and build a student-centered learning environment where the students take control of their learning and they take responsibility for the results. So long story short, a lot of the things that I was doing in my classroom, and I realized this many years later, were Scrum and Agile, 100%. Um, it would probably take me an entire hour to explain to you how everything worked. And, um, but I had to do what is like a, an agile transformation for my classroom. And it took a month, but I, I found it more satisfying for me, but I also found that the students were excited and they took ownership of it. And that was my first lesson in agile. You don't have to tell everybody what to do because in reality, they don't appreciate that. Nobody wants to be forced, right? Especially middle schoolers. They don't want to be forced to learn science. Um, but I did not need to get them to do a job, which was to learn and unfortunately pass the tests. And I did that. I ran my classroom that way for nine years and I pushed it to the best of my ability. And this was in the early to late 2000s. When Scrum was not a thing, Agile was not a thing, trust me, nobody cared about what I was doing. Um, and I didn't have any support. So I decided that I, I, I did that as much as I could and I left the teaching, um, the teaching world. And I went into business. Um, I went into business with another person. So this is something be way before Agile Mindset Consulting. And through that, I learned how to play all the roles in an organization. It was like an MBA, but learning on the job. And I understood what it was like to be um, an office manager, a business manager, um, an operations manager, a CTO, a CFO. I was in charge of all of these things at some point. So when I step into an organization as a Scrum Master Agile Coach, I have a different perspective because I understand and I have empathy for all these people. Um, I learned my passion for metrics because numbers, they, they speak a story, they tell the truth and they help you understand where your bottlenecks are and they identify the places where you need to try to test and learn in order to relieve the bottlenecks. And as you know, I mean, that's Scrum, that's Kanban, that's Agile right there. Um, and I was... I was really you know, pushing myself out of my comfort zone constantly, which was and is a requirement for a Scrum Master. You've gotta be willing to test and learn. You've gotta be willing to take on bigger and bigger things, um, things that you don't know how to do because that will help you grow. Um, I learned how to manage people. I learned how to coach people. <laughs> um, and you know, at, the, at some times, at some points in time, the business was struggling 
and we were working with a coach. And this is where my first interactions with a coach and consultant were. And that's where I learned how to do those things. So I guess my point, Nicole, is this was a very gradual process for me. And at the time, I didn't make a conscious decision to say, I'm doing a Scrum Master. But it's something that all of my skills that I collected naturally gravitated me towards. Now, I will say that I'm non-technical, like a lot of you, <laughs> such as yourself, Nicole. Um, and that is a challenge. It is, it's, a, it's an impediment, it's an obstacle, and you have to figure out a way around it. So take some coding classes, get to understand what it's like to be a developer, do something, sit beside people and learn what they do all day. Because you have to have enough experience with the software development lifecycle to help do your Scrum Master job effectively. But you can see I've gotten very far without knowing how to code. What I will say is that in this business that I had all those years ago, we designed custom software. We hired developers and I was put in charge of this project. So although I wasn't doing any other coding, this is where I got some software development experience. And again, I could have ran away. I could have said, no, I can't do this. I don't know how to do it because I didn't. I'd never work with developers in my life. Um, but it was incredibly helpful for me to have that experience as my first try, so to speak. Um, I was insanely frustrated with them. Sorry, Mark. Um, <laughs> I was insanely frustrated with them because I'm like, why does this take so long? They just have to like type some letters in the computer and the button appears on the screen and the button should just work. Like that was my perception of software development. And through this year long project that I worked on that we iterated, that we used Scrum Bon-ish, right, to do, I started to understand why it wasn't just typing a few letters in and a button appears and the button works. There's a lot more to it. So if you can start to understand what those folks go through on a daily basis, you can help guide them. Now, your job is not to tell them what to do. Your job is to guide them towards Agile and towards Scrum, but you got to have some empathy for, for what they're dealing with. And that's where I picked that up. And then, of course, when I landed on a software development team for real, I had a lot more things to learn. <laughs> and like you learn on the job, right? And it's just a matter of selling all the things that you have having the hiring manager or the employer give you a chance to learn those other things because you're so competent in the other areas. Did that answer your question, Nicole? Yeah, Thank probably you. and then some. <laughs> I like it, I like the journey. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Mark, did you wanna fill in any, um, any holes in the bucket there? I tell you what, we've got three people that have been very patiently waiting. Mm -hmm. If we have time at the end, sure, maybe we can totally. add that. But I want to make sure I pronounce your name right. Is it Shun or Chun? And is it Shun? Shun. Shun is next, and then Sherry, followed by Jacques. So that's our batting order. Okay. And there's a perfect Scrum Master modeling right there for you. Thank you, Mark. Okay. What's your question? Mm -hmm. Uh, my, my question actually, uh, I have a question because I often receive the same feedback from uh, uh, recruiters uh, when I apply uh, for a Scrum Master position. And uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one in the in this situation, so that's why I, I'm asking here. Uh, they usually say uh, they find a discussion and my resume interesting, but that the, the only thing I lack to land the Scrum Master job is a work experience. But uh, to get work experience, uh, one needs to be hired because or else I will just gather more uh, out of out of work experience, but that does not count. Uh, so um, that seems quite circular. So I'm not sure how to remove that impediment in particular. Mm -hmm. It is circular. It is a chicken or the egg, right? Um, that is a common statement made by, I mean, everybody, recruiters especially. Um, 
how does anybody get experience to do anything? A hands-on experience. Right. So from, and this is from my, and this is where my like entrepreneurial spirit and, and training has come in to help me get over that impediment. I've had to create my own experience because e either you are an effective salesperson, right? And you can sell and market yourself, which may be part of it here, right? It's speaking to your skills confidently. So we'll, we'll, we'll pause on that one because we'll come back to that. But it's about creating the experience that you need. And you will, this is, again, I feel like some of the times this is very tired, old, worn out advice, but find other places where you can implement Scrum, whether it is your current job, and it may or may not be, okay? So I'll, I'll just say that right here. Figure out ways that you can get started, right? Because you may not be able to implement Scrum in its fullest in your current job, but can you do some things? Can you go to, and Mark and I were just talking about the nonprofit world, they always need help. And if that's a good training ground for you to be a scrum master, I can't imagine any because you're not their boss, you're their volunteers, right? This is where you can build your influence skills. Go into some type of organization and get involved. You, you can't call them up necessarily and say, I'm a scrum master, give, give me some experience, I can do this for you. Go get involved with an organization, spend some time there, and this is maybe a long game, spend some time there, help them do something, and then say, hey, you know, I can do this as well. I see you're having trouble organizing this group of people. What do you think about me doing this? And offer, and it could be very simple, right? You put up a Kanban board, you teach people to how to write user stories, like whatever it is. So there's some more of the other pieces. Right. So you, you get these bits and pieces and then you start to collect them together. And then you say, now I'm more of a complete package. Maybe now I'm more confident in selling my skill set and marketing my skill set. But I will tell you, and this is what I say to everybody. And this is why I'm like, I don't want to give everybody the same old tired advice. What really did it for me was I started posting original content on LinkedIn. And I know, I know there's a, there might be a couple of people in here that do that. Um, it pushed me out of my comfort zone like nobody's business, right? Because it's imposter syndrome all over the place, right? And there's so much fear around that. But if you put yourself out there and start like a few days a week, showing people that you have ideas and you know something and you're, you're worthy of somebody taking a second look, and then they start to follow you. This is what happened to me like two and a half years ago, they, right? People started following me. Then they send me messages like, hey, can you help me with this? And I'm like, wait a second. I'm just putting content out there on LinkedIn. Right? I'm just writing some like educational stuff, right? Because I'm a teacher. Um, but it started to get me noticed. And then I started, you know, speaking at meetups, right? And it's all these little bits of things. And then it's like, you're in the right place, right time. And somebody's like, here, let me pass you to this recruiter because I believe in you and I will go speak to that person and tell them to give you an opportunity. So if you are committed to, to doing this job, it might take you all of these steps to get noticed and get your foot in the door. But like start now, because if it takes you three or four months, that um, that will pay off. Did that did that answer your question? And I think um, you're on mute. Oh, uh, yes, it did answer the question. And yes, I'm putting up content on LinkedIn, so I hope it will work. Keep going, because I will tell you, you will get no engagement for a, a while and you wanna give up, keep going. Because eventually the engagement starts and then you start showing up in people's feeds. It's like, it's, a, it's slow going at first, but then it picks up steam. 
And that's why you all are here. Like, seriously, you folks would not be here if I didn't like, put that first post up there. Honest truth. Okay, who's next? All Sherry? right. Sorry, Sherry. Mom. Hello, I have a question. Now that we are, uh, most teams are remote, um, have you, or how would you handle like, especially mostly devs who are not engaged in meetings, planning meetings, they're either working and not totally engaged. I'm seeing that a lot on my team and stuff. Um, and like, how would you approach these people? <laughs> 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 the age-old question right right yeah it's a bit of a can of worms mm -hmm. and like like i was saying about the finding the job and landing the job it's a long game so it's not something that's going to happen overnight what i do and i'm trying not to give the same old so same old advice but some of this probably will be the same old advice um you've got to build one-on-one -on -one relationships with people especially if they're introverts because they are not going to want to turn on their cameras. They are not going to want to speak up, right? They just want to do their work. Um, and that's their, that's their comfort zone. So pushing them, shoving them out of their comfort zone and expecting them to do these things overnight is probably going to make them nervous. So I don't know if you do one-on-ones. I haven't yet because I'm still kind of more testing than I'm doing the dual role mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's where like, it's a fine line and stuff. I still want to be a <laughs> good team member and I'm not like 100% right. like scrum master mode. Like you're in that dual know. hat. You're, you're in that yeah. dual hat. And it is that that's a challenge when companies and they do it for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But it, I don't, you, you I want to say they don't understand the position that it puts you in. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, it does put you in this weird mode because you're the coach and <laughs> you're, you're the driver of the scrum process, but you're also participating in the development. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes you not know how to walk. Well, first of all, where's the line? And then yep. not know how to, how to walk the line. But, but the thing is, you, you do have the role as scrum master on that, that team. So you, you, so you do start doing some of those one-on-ones and yep. Okay. Get to know them as people. And the, they may be, they may bomb at first, right? But you got to keep going. And regardless of what the reaction is to you, you got to keep going. And a couple um, of them, I've been working with them for four years and I feel like they've just started like shutting down and stuff too. So don't talk to them about work. Mm -hmm. Talk to them about like, Hey, where do you live? And, you know, tell me, I mean, this, I've worked with people all over the world and I guess I'm just such a curious person. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh, I heard you live in, you know, you live in Goa. I've never been there. Can you, can you tell me about it? Right. And they start telling me about their lives and then they open up to me. And I do this with every single person and it may take some time, right? There's a delay. But when you start to get these people to open up to you, then they start to open up to each other little bits mm -hmm. in the meetings, in the yep. events. Okay. And then when you see that, you have to foster it. Okay. And I think one of the hardest thing is, is asking questions and sitting back and saying nothing and letting people sit with the uncomfortable silence that you expect them to fill that, that vacuum. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jacques, you can enter the batter's box. It's your time to bat. All right. Um, go see what I can get if I can get a home run or at least a double out of this. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so just kind of playing off of this. Um, so I've been listening. So just kind of Briefly, so I've been in career transition. I, you know, likely came out of education. I'd been a director for several years on a pair side. So that's where I really worked with project management. So if I have the title, you know, I did scrum, I did agile project management, risk management, quality manager, resource of training of volunteers, went back into teaching for a year and in the school year, spent the summer studying for the PMP, took two business courses, got the PMP. Um, through my director experience, I was able to translate. So that made me eligible to take the PMP. But 
Um, it's just, it's been kind of a rough go around and kind of just echoing about the scrum master. I know, um, I think just a few questions I have, I've been networking on LinkedIn, um, for a while I was getting all sorts of responses, but now it's just, it's kind of dried up. Um, I know two people who got so popular, they started charging now. They still luckily do messaging. One of them is very diligent with the messaging part, at least, which is good. Um, that makes me happy that he's still willing to communicate that way for free because, <laughs> yeah, that'd be a whole other thing. But anyways, um, kind of like taking a few of the suggestions. Um, one is what's the best way to approach for networking, for learning, um, even if it's not, you know, so kind of a few questions and I'm sorry, but how to approach for networking <clears throat> with other PMs, with other scrum masters that are going to have them respond, or is it luck of the draw too? Um, even if before, after applying for positions, how to approach hiring managers, like especially PMs to get ourselves out there, um, especially if we know our resume may not get us in the door and to kind of get us past that. Um, just any thoughts from your end? I've had a few people but then the third one, you you know, third and fourth one, you mentioned about how to create like ways to create our own experience. I immediately missed part of that. My Wi-Fi cut out. But what are some ways to write content on LinkedIn that will stand out for PM? Like, does this mean I create a project or project manager software? Do I start my own blog? Like, how do I create content on LinkedIn? So this maybe just I know that's a lot but that's really what popped in my mind through this. That would be really helpful to know. Those are great questions. Um, I think for the first one, it is tough. Um, and I'm just, you know, I, I'm thinking back to when I started networking and I just, I wanna be honest with you folks because I, I feel like people were not honest with me. <laughs> um, you know, and this, this was a number of years ago, I had no network. I knew like five people in the agile community. Um, and it's like, at some point you keep going back to people and asking questions and asking questions and asking questions. And either it's, you know, I was asking them the same questions over and over and I wasn't listening and they got frustrated. So that could be a possibility. Um, but also, if you put yourself in that person's shoes, and I'm trying to think of... <laughs> and I'm not saying reach out to the same people, but just different people in general. Sorry. I think that for me, being on the other side of it. And I, this is something that I did not understand years ago, but now that I'm on the other side of what you're talking about, for me, I think it's seeing the same people show up to me over and over and over and over and not ask for anything. Okay. And I think, and, and I'm thinking back to when I was, for starting to network. So this is like 2018. I showed up to people with the intention like I needed something from them. I needed them to give me something. I needed, I needed, I needed. And I felt like I had nothing to offer them. And I, that was uncomfortable for me because I felt like initially people were very generous with their time. And then I started to feel really bad because I'm like, I have nothing to give to these people in return. But what people would sometimes say to me is you have to show up kind of like as a grasshopper willing to learn from people, but not ask them for anything. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. And, and that's the approach like, and that's kind of more what I'm looking to do. Yeah. You know, it's like how to approach that part because I do get the occasion where I ask genuinely about scrum about, and it's just like, do they, think I'm asking for a job that's really not my intention at this point right. because I know I can learn from that so I think that was kind of more my question yeah. that is not only networking for that but just how do I convey in a way that they're not jumping to conclusions yeah. and they're for going to yeah. ignore me it's like any relationship it's building trust and the only way that you can build trust with somebody is to have repeated conversations with them with no intention behind it well this isn't conversations this is like even getting them to respond 
That's what I'm talking about. You don't have that trust yet. So do we just keep reaching out? Like what's your suggestion with that? Or is it just keep finding people that will? Well, I, I will tell you again, from my perspective, right? I do this meetup biweekly. Okay. There are definitely people that show up all the time. And I know who you are. Like I see you in the room, right? Those people that show up I know that they're just not bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing around, looking for a silver bullet. Um, You know, and it kind of comes back to people, you know, bounce around from me. And I did this myself. So I'm like speaking from experience and I had to like, I got very frustrated. Um, It's kind of like you have to show up to the same few people and just be willing to listen and learn and absorb. And they will see that you're somebody, and I don't, I hate to use this word, but this is like what's coming to my mind. Somebody who's worthy because they're not just a flash in the pan. And the people that show up to this meetup consistently, if I have some opportunity, I'm gonna reach out to those people because I know that I see them all the time. I know that they're dedicated. I know that they're, um, because they constantly show up in front of me, I know they're, they, Mark, you know what I'm talking about. You're, you're, you're shaking your head because you're, you're kind of like in my position too. Like when I see the same person show up, I'm like, they're dedicated. They're not just bouncing around. They're serious. And if I have something, I will reach out and I'll say, I have an opportunity for you. Are you interested? Okay. No, that's good to know. If Thank you. Don't you. build that trust, even if it's just visual trust. The person doesn't know who you are, so they don't know if you're worthy of investing their time. Okay. Does that make sense, Mark? Do you want to add to that? So one thing I wanted to just add was a quick time check. I yes. meant to hit you at the midway point, but yes. we're eight minutes after. So just giving you that sure. quick. The only thing I'll add. Patty and Jock is that you're just not going to hit it off with everybody. And when I started networking, you know, I really tried hard to network with some people and just for whatever reason, my personality just didn't maybe mesh with theirs. And you just, sometimes you just have to move on and, um, you know, find other connections that you do, that you do have a, uh, things in common with, you know, I don't know what to say, like with Patty, we just have a very similar mindset. And so it was very easy to, to talk with her and to, for me to understand her. Others, not so much. And uh, I'm not going to say that you just totally cut them loose, but, um, you yeah, know, yeah. you just don't, you can't win every battle. I don't know saying that. Thank you. And you have this every Tuesday, you said? Every other Tuesday. Every other Tuesday. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm yeah. writing it down. Um, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Sure. All right. Well, I think Rebecca is ready to step up to the plate. So Rebecca, and then I've got a question from the, uh, from the chat to ask you, Patty. Hi, Patty. Hey, Rebecca. Uh, so I, I sent you a message on LinkedIn earlier today too. Um, mine, I guess, is a little bit like somebody asked about connecting with the developers. And in my particular situation, I feel like I've connected well with the developers but it's the product owner who is less engaged with the process. And Mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like he kind of passes it off to other people. But then when it comes time to the demo, it's like, well, why didn't you do these, these, these things? But he always seems too busy to meet with the group. So any advice you have on, um, I I know you mentioned trust and that's one thing, but um, the too busy seems to come up a lot. So any advice you have on that? I have two two thoughts about that. Does he understand the impact that his behavior is having on the team? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Do you have a trusting relationship to ask him about that? Um. Like I've tried to set up some meetings with him and they get canceled or too busy to join. Okay. 
So um, I've, I've been taking <laughs> leadership more from the subject matter expert, yeah. um, taking his advice on how to facilitate things. Yeah. I would say, ask, the, the other thought I had is ask the person, you know, the, again, building up that relationship so you can have honest conversations is, is, is the first thing. But, you know, for me, I just ask questions. <laughs> like, I just do it. Um, what, what is the, the root cause of him being so busy that he can't keep a meeting with you? I think just juggling so many different projects, he's um, high up in the company. So just having too many things to, yep. too many projects that he has to keep track of, I guess. Yep. Or maybe you could share what are, what are some of the communication techniques or um, styles of writing that you've found effective in with stakeholders or those higher up the chain? I would, for me, and then this goes back to what I said with Sherry, like you've, you've got to have one-on-ones with people. That, I mean, I don't, I don't know what else to say about that, but you've got to get to know this person and say, you know, how can I support you? You know, what's going on? What, find out, I mean, get them to say it, right? You can observe all of these things, but you have to get this person to say these things out loud. I'm stressed out. I can't juggle all this. I'm having problems with this, right? And, and getting them to say these things out loud, then you can say, well, how can I help you? Because it is my mm -hmm. role to help you. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you can help this person do differently, coach them. And it might be very difficult, right? Change is hard for people. They'd rather just keep doing the same crazy things over and over because they know how to do that. But your, your, your goal is to help them get out of that state. So first they have to realize it, which means you have to have a conversation with them to start talking to them about these things. What can we do differently? you know, do you realize the impact that this is having on the team? Is there a way that some of this stuff can come up in the retro? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, obviously I'm not in your retro. I don't know what, what's coming up as the, the, the challenges to overcome and what are the action items, but is there a way that you can try to have this come up in the retro so the team can start talking about it. Because if this person doesn't understand how they are impacting the team and you, <laughs> um, <laughs> how, how can they, they know to, to change anything? Thank that, you. That would be where I would start. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because going in there and saying, you know, you're, you know, you're managing too much, you're doing too much, you're not participating, like, people don't want to hear that they you have to get them to say it on their own. So they realize that they're, they're causing their own pain and then say, Okay, well, what are we going to do about it? This is the, the heart of coaching. So figure out how to get that meeting. And if if the person keeps canceling, say, how, how can we get a meeting on the calendar that works for you, <laughs> right? Use, be, use your, your questions. Mm -hmm. Because this is gonna keep on perpetuating until, until you can have a conversation with this person. Mm -hmm. Okay, Patty, we're at the yes. 15 minute remaining mark and we've got four questions. Keep going. So Rebecca, I'll just add you one thing. I'll add you a technique that somebody used to me when they always said they're too busy. Tell them, oh, well, you're, you'll make your Saturdays and Sundays fully open to them. So anytime they want to choose between Saturday and Sunday, you'll be willing to meet them. It's amazing how their calendar opens up when you offer that. All right, Judith, you're up. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so as a person who's trying to break into the... Um, 
this field, do you think that being a developer first would be, you kind of answered my question a little bit earlier, but do you think you recommend being a developer first and then working your way, um, actually being like on the scrum team to better, you know, be a, a coach and a teacher for your, for your team later on? That is one route. A lot of companies will want to hire developers, former developers to be their scrub masters. And again, like everything else, there's a lot of reasons why they might do that. Um, it might help you get your foot in the door, but some of the challenges that I've seen with developers, they have different challenges with, with being a scrum master. So a non-technical person has certain challenges. A technical person has certain challenges and it is, they get in the weeds with the team. They, cause, cause they know how to do the work. They want to tell the team how to do the work. They get into like, you know, estimating and like all the things that the scrum master shouldn't be doing. And then they're like, nah, I'd, re I'd rather be a developer or they just continue to struggle or they are a hindrance to the team. So it's not necessarily the solution, but companies will go for that because I think it makes them feel comfortable. Um, you could go the BA route. So you can be a business analyst. Um, or there are other uh, teacher clients that I have. I mean, they made the leap from teacher to, to scrum master. <laughs> Let me see if any of them are in the room here. Yes, one of them is in the room here. Um, some of them are not here today, but they made the leap. And what did they do? Not all of them, but they put original content out there on LinkedIn because it shows the people that they know their stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, um, I have noticed a lot of teachers transitioning and um, I have spoke to other scrum masters like on LinkedIn and connected and they I, I remember one that did um, recommend being a BA and so that's kind of the route that I'm trying to do just to get my foot in the door even though it's kind of hard since I don't have my bachelor's yet it's still kind of difficult getting my foot in the door but I mean I just have to stay consistent so thank you. All right, we're gonna to move to the lightning round here pretty soon, Patty, 12 minutes left. We have a question in chat and it says, any tips for estimating work? We are creating a system to enhance care for emergency preparedness. Interesting. This is not software development or curriculum development, more like hosting a focus group, holding key informant interviews, analyzing the feedback, developing a toolkit based on feedback, then hosting town hall meetings to disseminate findings. So what I, if I'm understanding correctly, you, you need to estimate some of these things. And I hope she doesn't mind me, yes, Yolanda. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. You talk about the Fibonacci sequence and these poke, you know, poker and all of that, but the work, I haven't been able to translate estimating for the work that I'm doing. Yeah, I figured out user stories and what that means. I figured out some of the team members but integrating the estimation has been difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's not uncommon, even for software development teams. <laughs> First of all, human beings are notoriously horrible at estimate how, estimating how long it takes to do anything. So let's just put that out on the table. Um, I think there's a comfort in saying, this is gonna take me X number of hours or X number of days. But the fact of the matter is, there's so much more that gets, there's so much more involved than just time that you have to factor those things in. So is there some type of uncertainty that's going to add time onto it, right? Is there, you know, I have to wait on somebody to do their part before I can finish my part, right? So using time although there's a comfort level around it is, is dangerous. And that's some of the challenges with project management because they say it's gonna take us two years to do this and every step is gonna take this amount of time and we're just gonna stay on schedule. And that never happens. So when it comes to estimation, like you're talking about Fibonacci, right? You know, you have to 
excuse me, get the group to agree on something that would equal a one, right? And you could say, okay, I don't know, in, in my, my cohort, we use fruit. How long does it take you to consume a strawberry? What's the effort level? What's the complexity, right? You might assign that a one. Now compare it to an apple, right? So these are things people can relate to. What do you have to do to consume that apple, right? You might have to peel it. You have to cut it, make sure the seeds are not there because supposedly they're full of arsenic. Um, it might take you longer. So there's, there's time and complexity there. So if you can relate that task to something that people um, can, can relate to, they might be able to understand it a little bit better. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Elmira. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I have been to this before. <laughs> so, uh, I just want to make some comments about the questions. I, I don't have any questions, but I just want to make some comments. Sure. Um, I've been working as a product owner and the Scrum Master in the, that's field what I am doing right now, actually, because our team doesn't have a Scrum Master and I have to fill in that position as well. And uh, some questions, like I heard from the beginning uh, about how to get into this field, like what was will be the suggestions. Uh, my, I will try to not talk too long, but um, my suggestions, like for the people who doesn't have any experience, um, maybe try to get involved um, like on any type of like these meetings. And I have been saying that before as well. Uh, this type of meetings, we have them like now it's everything online, right? Like we have so many uh, meetings online on you can find it on Meetup or uh, Eventbrite. And uh, you can like kind of hearing the other people what they're talking about, like really about the Scrum Master position. I think that's helpful to get understand what exactly the Scrum, position, Scrum Master position is. And, uh, um, and the other thing, of course, like going online, reading more about uh, Scrum Master or what they are doing. And um, this will help you to get maybe get the picture better. And the other thing I will say, the certifications. Um, for me, as me, like I get the certification on the scrum.org and I know that also you can get it from the Scrum, scrum Alliance, but for the Scrum Alliance, you have to pay, but the scrum.org, it's kind of like for the study, you can do your own study, but uh, the exam itself, it is cheaper like it's about like $100 or $150 or something like that. And I think that's kind of helpful uh, to get to know that you kind of more like validate your knowledge. And I think I would say something like validate your knowledge. I think that's helpful as well. And I will not be afraid to send cold emails to the recruiters because uh, you kind of get to know the recruiters that you are looking for some certain uh, position as a Scrum Master, right? And um, it, I think it helped you to kind of be, know that you are open for any type of Scrum Master role. And uh, when you are um, putting up yourself there on the LinkedIn, and of course, keep, like, keep your LinkedIn more like fresh. And I think when you have it fresh uh, uh, LinkedIn, uh, it will kind of, show that recruiters that you are uh, looking for something. And I think that it's also the other thing that um, get more um, connection with the recruiters. And uh, the other thing I will recommend, um, when you posting something on the LinkedIn, like I am sure some of you like go to the churches or come go to the school, uh, some kind of meeting that your kids has in the, running some kind of, um, volunteering there and you can post it something like oh i've been uh, running the meeting or running uh delegating the job at the some kind of event right or helping organizing this event and this is all really the relate to the scrum position because that's what you are doing with the team as well when you are uh running some kind of meetings or helping others to do these meetings or organizing these um, 
uh, events or something. This is really Scrum Master role, kind of helping and organizing. And if you will post some kind of this stuff, I think it will kind of like, if you been volunteering or doing something with your kids or even maybe in your community that has to be kids, uh, anything like that, I think it's kind of helpful uh, putting up yourself and even if you're posting this on the LinkedIn with your picture or we've been volunteering kind of things, um, this is kind of put you out there. And also, of course, doing the self-study, like I will get uh, experience on Jira, Trilo and Miro kind of things like, because this, even try it at yourself at home, how you use the Jira board or Trilla board, the mirror board, like how you posting, like how the stories are moving there. This is kind of picturing and also talking to other Scrum Masters, like talking, like, let's say like I'm a Scrum Master or the product owner, you can ask me how is really this actually work? Like how, what is your position? For me, I came to this role. Uh, I've been actually um, working as a, um, an apprenticeship program as a um, developer. Uh, I went to the, uh, in the beginning, I went to uh, bootcamp as for, to become a developer. But my intent to go to the bootcamp wasn't to be a developer. I wanna learn how to actually uh, mm, technology work. But I knew in the future, I want to move more like management position, uh, like being, on like product owner or the Scrum Master role. And uh, it helped me to be a developer. It's helped me to understand what the exactly product owner or the Scrum Master do. And uh, I move out to the product owner role, but now I'm on both positions just because the, our, our organization run that way. And I have to fill in the product, uh, the Scrum Master role as well, but it's mm -hmm. helped me. And I, I understand it's harder way because you have to become a developer, right? Mm -hmm. But easier way really thinking about to become only Scrum Master. My, my way was a little bit different, but if you want to become just a Scrum Master, that the, I would say like, volunteer, go and post that. And this is really, that's what the Scrum Master do. Like they are um, running the meetings. Like uh, as uh, Patty earlier said, the Mark, what he's doing right now, he does this Scrum Master thing. Like that's what like, now your turn, now your turn. What you've been, what, what, the, what story you are working on. That's how you're doing with startup starting. You're questioning, not questioning, but you're kind of giving time to your developers Tell what they have done yesterday and what we're going to be working today or what impediments they have. But like if they are doing some kind of uh, ticket, what's the thing that is holding them to do the ticket future, yeah. like keep going, right? <laughs> kind yeah. of thing. So that's yep. my things about how to get the experience or like if even you might already have that experience you you can like the other lady i forget her name i think chang uh she she was asking like how i can get that experience you might already have this experience you may be already volunteering and you may be already running these uh meetings or helping some other uh, organizations or the church uh to doing some kind of stuff there that organizing things, right? That is already yep. your experience already. You've been already organizing. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm probably taking a little bit of time. Yep. And we're, we're, we're just about, I think we're technically out of time. So I hate to cut you off there, Omira. Um, but that was all awesome, awesome advice. I hope everybody was really cued in and listening to the advice Omira was giving because that was awesome advice. Patty, we do have another couple questions, but I know we're out of time. Do you want to just take those offline? Sure. Um, or or it's I, can, up to you. I mean, I can stay and an answer, you know, an, another few. Sometimes it's easier to answer it live and in person than kind of type okay. it out. Um, but Jacques, I do, I do want to go back to your, your LinkedIn content. Um, it is scary because you're like, what, what do I write about? And I mean, everybody struggles with this, not just Scrum Masters. What do I write about? Well, it's more about credibility. Like, what do I even have the credibility? Because it's going out in public. And that's what someone brought up to me. It's like, you have right. to be careful, basically. I just started, 
I started doing what I did best, educating. So I would put up <laughs> educational, you know, I, I mean, I could show you the, the stuff that I used to post two and a half years That'd ago. Be it would be like a word and I'd define the word and I'd explain it because I was trying to help new people understand what these terms meant. Because a lot of times people are afraid to raise their hand and say, I don't understand what a user story is. I don't understand what, you know, an art is agile release train like what and Curtis i and i saying. could exp and i could explain that even if i don't have a project i have the pmp but i could still put that even if i don't have the title you can post whatever you want <laughs> seriously okay. what are you passionate about right even okay. if it's not related to scrum and agile how can you talk about how scrum and agile is related to that okay um you know my my, my former teach I taught I started talking about science right Mark you talked about Newton's laws right this is going back to like physics class when I taught um, school I just did a I just did a presentation on Newton's laws and how that is really about human behavior like the laws of physics right is really about human behavior I'm passionate about science so I thought about how can I relate what I'm passionate about to scrum and agile concepts and it's like the light bulbs just went off and I'm like, I'm just going to write a presentation about this and I'm going to give it to whoever will listen. And like, and, and they did, right? And I got positive feedback. I'm like, oh, heck, Mark, you and Jamie, hey, can I speak to the Scrum Masters of the Universe again? I want to talk about the scientific method, right? I'm passionate about science. That's what I know about. What are their Scrum Masters talking about science? Zero, right? There's my niche. There's my thing, so to speak, right? I, another topic I'm passionate about is yoga. I haven't broached that subject yet very much, <laughs> but like yoga and agile are, are like the same thing, right? And it, like, how can I talk to the LinkedIn audience about yoga? Okay. So you think about what you're passionate about and then start, start making the connections and people are like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Even if you're like, oh, this is just me. Somebody else thinks it's cool. And then they start to notice and then they start to follow you. And then they're like, maybe we should give this guy a chance, right? Okay, you no. You up your resume, then you contact recruiters, then you do this, then you do that, right? And it all like the universe, like the planets align. Okay, no, thank you. I mean, if you'd be help? able to, oh uh, yeah, no, it helps. If um, I guess I could find you on LinkedIn. If you'd be able to send me some of the samples, I'd really appreciate that. And yeah. and also in this, like, how do I find this so that way I don't miss it next time? Mm -hmm. Is this like on your LinkedIn? Um, well, yes, um, but I but when I will send out the the email with the recording on Monday, you'll just get reminders. Don't okay. forget in two weeks, we have a meetup. Don't forget next week, we have a meetup. So I just send out a reminder so people remember to show up. So you'll be awesome. on that reminder list. Okay, awesome. No, thank you, Patty. I really I really appreciate that. That's really helpful. And yeah, so basically what I'm passionate about or just find different terminologies and just go off on, hey, this is what I think it is. This is how you apply to it. And you test and learn. Honestly, like that's where I started. I started because that's my comfort zone, educating people on stuff. Um, okay. And I evolved, I evolved beyond that, but I stuck with it to get to the point where I evolved on, beyond that. So it's a long game, Okay. but it'll get you noticed. I, I promise you. Okay, thank you, well, appreciate you're it. You're welcome. You got time for one more quick one, Patty? Yeah, sure. Okay, Shane has been very patient. She posted in the chat and she asked a good question. She asked, Patty, what was it like for you at the start of your first Scrum Master job? Anything to anticipate or prep for? That's a good question. So as I mentioned, I kind of transitioned into it, right? My first, but my first official Scrum Master job that you see like on my LinkedIn profile, um, I worked for a startup for a number of years and I felt like I was just, I felt like I was winging it. I just felt like I was learning along <laughs> with everybody, but that's where I started to lean on 
all my other skills because I'm like, I don't know what these people are talking about. So where can I start? And that's where I started with the one on ones. And I started just talking to people about stuff. Tell me about where you live. Tell me about what you did this weekend. Oh, I heard you're struggling with getting your, you know, story moved along on the board, right? Then you kind of start asking them other questions. Like what's getting in the way of, you know, I, this, this has been in progress for a week now. Like what's getting in the way of you moving that along? And then you start to ask those types of questions. And it's not like, how can I help you do your job? It's just asking the questions to help them get out of their own way. So that's where I learned to be, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it was like when I went to, I went on a, a solo trip to Germany in 2018. And I, I speak a little bit of German. I'm like, I can read a kindergarten level book. I've been there a few times. I'm like, I can get around, no problem. Meanwhile, I, I'm always, my partner's German. He's a native speaker. So that makes it kind of easy. But like when I go by, go by myself, all of a sudden I forget basic words, you know, cause you start to panic. And then you're like, okay, like I have to figure out how to get through this. I have to have the courage cause I got to eat. I got to figure out how to go into a restaurant and order because I don't have a choice. So it's being uncomfortable with not understanding what people are saying to you and figuring out how to make it through anyway. That's what I did. And now I'm like, it doesn't matter. I don't understand what they're saying because I'm looking for human behavior. I'm looking for what they're doing and what they're not saying and how they're interacting. And to me, like what they're working on is not important because I'm, I'm looking at human di dynamics because that like, that's my thing. Did that answer the question? <laughs> All right, well, I know we're, we're having people steadily drop off because it it's 6.30 here on the East Coast and kind of dinner time, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and send me a message on LinkedIn. I thank you. I, I thank you for coming here and, and giving me this opportunity to do this. I've never done this before. Um, this is my first, you know, ask me anything type thing. So like I walk the walk, like I put myself out there and I do the hard things too. Right. Cause I've got like Mark got to model the behavior. So I hope everybody has a good evening. And we'll see you in two weeks. Um, we have, that would be on the fourth. We have a guest speaker coming. So I will be announcing that soon. Okay. So thank you so All much. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.